darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done nothing, having done everything to stand firm. Through July 8th, we'll be learning about the power which can protect us from a much greater threat than just flesh and blood and steel. This morning, we asked the question that St. Mar Mark has been pushing us towards this whole time. Who is Jesus really? We now welcome forward Pastor Ted Carnahan. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to Worship at Spirit of Grace. We'll begin our worship this morning with the words that you'll find on the screen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Amen. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. We take a moment for silent reflection on our own need for forgiveness. Eternal God, our creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were sinners. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also, also with, with you. you. We sing. God of creation, eternal majesty, you preside over land and sea, sh sunshine and storm. By your strength, pilot us. By your power, preserve us. By your wisdom, instruct us. And by your hand, protect us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You're invited to be seated. We now welcome forward our reader for this morning, Charles Weed. If you'd like to follow along with the lesson on your mobile device, download the Spirit of Grace app or go online to sog.church slash Sunday. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. 
And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the, we- and the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for reading our lesson this morning, Charles. Good morning, everybody. And once again, welcome to Spirit of Grace. I'm glad that you're with us this morning. If you're joining us online today, I hope that you're using our live streaming site, live.sog.church, which also gives you access to scripture through our online Bible and some notes and the response cards. All right. So we've come to the point in what is actually a little bit longer series than we normally do. We're in, we're in week five of six in this uh, this sermon series that we've been calling um, Up Armored Faith. And the idea behind this series has been that there are enemies arrayed against us that are more than flesh and blood and steel, that there are things that we cannot take care of on our own. And a story like the one that Charles read for us today from Mark's Gospel definitely underscores that point. There are times in military conflict where no matter how well trained, equipped, and deployed and led soldiers are that they get into tight spots. I was reading recently the story of a, uh, the honor of the Distinguished Flying Cross uh, that was given to two Air Force officers last month. This is the story of the, the first guy. The guy on the right there is Captain William uh, Dana. Uh, his nickname is Archer. The engagement, and I'm, I'm reading from the Air, Force, uh, the Air Force press release, the engagement occurred on August 14th when Dana and his wingman were alerted by a a joint terminal attack controller that enemy forces had breached friendly lines in eight locations and inflicted multiple casualties. As soon as we checked in, there was an immediate need for support, Dana said. There was a sense of urgency felt. I needed to get out there quickly because good guys were dying. Over the course of the next three hours, Dana dropped 11,000 pounds of ordnance, killed 37 enemy fighters, and destroyed 10 defensive fighting positions. Low on fuel and munitions and with pro-Syrian regime aircraft tracking his movements, Dana decided to conduct one more strike on enemy fighters holed up in a four-story building. They had been attacking friendlies from only 30 meters away. For point of reference, that's from the nursery door to the information center. At the point of weapons release, I trusted my training, Dana said. Dana's bomb was within, quote-unquote, danger close distance meaning there was a chance that friendlies could be injured due to their proximity to the target. He says, I had to account for the wind because that affects where the ordnance drops, and with friendlies being that close, I wanted to take responsibility for everything, Dana said. This is my weapon from my jet, and the effects are on me. The weapon hit its target and silenced the enemy without any friendly casualties. Captain uh, Dana was flying in support of uh, pro... um, or the, the rebels fighting against the pro-Syrian forces uh, in, in Syria during the, in the S- Syrian civil war, some of whom are uh, ISIS and ISIS-affiliated groups, and there's a whole bunch. It's a huge mess out there. Um, so the people that were on the ground mostly were not American soldiers. They were um, soldiers that were fighting against the brutal regime of Bashar al-Assad. But there were American soldiers on the ground directing the attack uh, from the air. And they were in a position where they were surrounded, their defensive line had been breached, and they were in really big trouble. And at a time like that, the only thing that they could do was get on the radio and hope that the A-10 Warthog that Captain Dana was flying would get there in time. And fortunately, he arrived in time and... uh, and in the face of a lot of uh, fire from ground to air, did, uh, did a good job in protecting uh, our allies. The same is true in the life of faith. There are lots of things that we can handle on our own, and we as individual Americans like to pride ourselves on being uh, people who have got our act together. We know how to do what we do. Uh, we can take care of ourselves. We look down on people who aren't taking good care of themselves. 
Um, we are especially focused on people making individual decisions and individual effort, and I love that individual spirit because it really does make our country a good thing, a great thing even. The idea of individual liberty as opposed to collective rights, for example, is one of those foundational parts of the Constitution that we are celebrating as we get to Independence Day this year. But it's also true that we come to points in our lives where we are fighting against forces that are stronger than we are. Uh, the famous Lutheran hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, the whole first verse, <laughs> I, I was reflecting on this uh, this morning because the, 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 the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, is a hymn that you cannot just sing verse 1 because verse, it tells a story and the end of verse 1 is, uh, the devil is more powerful than anybody on earth and we're all doomed. Cheery. And of course, but then a champion comes to fight, and that's Christ Jesus the Lord. And after you get through a couple more verses, you realize that our strength and our victory is not from our own power, but through the power of Christ. I think that our story from Mark's gospel today underscores the reality of needing to call in support when we can't handle a situation on our own. Mark 4, 35 starts out, On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let's go across to the other side. Keep in mind, Jesus has been teaching and healing uh, in, uh, in the Galilee region, and now they're getting onto a boat on the Sea of Galilee, and they're going to be crossing over to the other side. And one of the important parts comes at the beginning of verse 36. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. So in other words, Jesus is being hounded by hundreds, if not thousands, of people who have heard about the deeds of power done in his name, and they want in. And who can blame them? He's offering miracles for free. But he comes to the point where he can't take the pressure from all around. He needs rest, and his mission is carrying him into new country, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. We're no longer really dealing with the people of Israel anymore. It's one of his forays into Gentile territory. And so they get in the boat, but then other boats come with them. In other words, they see Jesus get in the boat, and they said, we got boats, let's get on our boats, and they take off after him. And this little flotilla of small wooden craft, probably no more than 20 or 30 feet long, go off across the lake. And in the late afternoon, when evening had come, as is often the case on the Sea of Galilee, that's when storms come rolling over the mountains to the west from the Mediterranean and pouring down into that basin. If you think that perhaps you can do it all on your own and you, can't, and you, you don't have to rely on other people for help from time to time, I would invite you to consider the example of the Son of God who was overwhelmed and pressed upon on all sides and needed the disciples to take him as he is and put him in the boat. And it's easy to imagine that with that phrase, to take him as he is, they almost were like, all right, come on. And they just picked him up and carried him off. He was exhausted. He needed help. And so he lays down in the stern of the boat, and off they go across the water, which quickly becomes whipped up into a frenzy. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. And where's Jesus? Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat on a cushion. He is hanging out in the back of the boat, fast asleep, and the waves are coming up and down. And you can imagine it's like a, I guess Mary probably rocked him to sleep like that when he was a baby. It probably felt great. <laughs> he's, having a, he's having a nice snooze. But isn't it the truth that sometimes what we think of as a storm that threatens our very existence, it seems like God is asleep. Sailors definitely were a superstitious bunch. I won't say that they are today, but they are. And uh, they were especially back then. Sailors in that day uh, firmly believed that the sea itself was not a place. It was not that it was a place that God hadn't created or that it wasn't a place that God had power, but there was something evil in the sea. One needs only look at some of the creatures that get hauled up from deep under the sea uh, and take a good look at them to discover that there's something a little bit off about the ocean. 
And as they go out on the sea, they experience the storm as being spiritually significant. The storm rises up quickly, and they would have seen this as a work of evil opposing them, a work of evil threatening to overturn the boat and kill them all under the waves. And Jesus Christ is asleep on the cushion in the stern. You can imagine them being torn. Have you ever been torn between trying to let somebody sleep who really needed to sleep and waking them up because you really needed to talk to them? It's like, I don't want to wake you. When, when Jennifer needs extra rest, I'm like this. I, I got a question for her, and I better not go in there. But I really need to, but I better not go in there. Finally, they can't take it anymore. And they wake him up and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I'm dying here. Help me out. And that's our question too. When it seems like God's asleep in the stern of the boat. Don't you care? I mean, obviously, if you're the, the prince of the universe, the king of heaven and earth, you know what's going on. What's going on? Where are you? Can't you see that we are dying? And I think sometimes what we mean is, why haven't you solved this problem yet? Or why haven't you solved this problem the way I want you to solve it? We desire personal control before we feel like it's really going to be okay. And if there is one thing that you cannot have when you are on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, it's 100% personal control. And in the absence of an answer from Jesus, it's like he's not even there. What good is a Jesus in the boat if he's asleep? He might as well be on the moon if he's not going to be awake and figuring this problem out for me. Sometimes we don't realize that Jesus is with us in the boat. And help is just a prayer away. But as often as the case, I run into people with the question, what happens when God doesn't answer our prayers? What, happens, what does it mean that I, I prayed for something to get fixed and it didn't get fixed? I prayed for healing and healing didn't come. I prayed for a solution to my problem and it seems like I'm still stuck in it. And it may sound trite or petty, but I really do think it's true. And sometimes we have a hard time distinguishing between the absence of an answer, which seems like Jesus is not in the boat, and an answer that doesn't create a change immediately. And we have a difficult time distinguishing between the answer no to our request and a question which is an answer which is oftentimes simply not that way or not yet. The difficult thing for us as Christians is to take seriously the Lord's Prayer. Because when Jesus teaches us to pray, what does he teach us? He doesn't teach us to pray, my kingdom come, my will be done, do it my way, God, because you're my cosmic ATM. I've deposited my card, the Christian card, right? You've heard of people playing the Christian card in politics. Well, you got your card, you stick it in the slot, and you push in your pin code, and then it's supposed to spit out the answer just like you wanted it in exactly the right denominations. But it's not my kingdom come, it's thy kingdom come. It's not what I want, it's what you want. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. And I'm reminded of Luther's explanation of that part of the Lord's Prayer in the small catechism. Because he wants to answer a question which I don't know a lot of us are asking, but maybe we implicitly believe this. I don't know. But the question he wants to know is, so wait a minute, if I don't pray this, am I saying like, God, I'm not going to let your kingdom come. I'm not going to let your will be done. And Luther's quick to say, you don't get a choice in that. God's kingdom is coming and God's will is going to be done whether you like it or not. It is not up to you how the prayer is answered. It is not up to you how God's kingdom comes. It's not up to you what you think ought to be the solution the solution is for you to pray, I know that your kingdom is coming and I know that your will will be done on, heaven, in he on earth as it already is in heaven. 
But in this prayer, Lord, I pray that it would be done in and through me. They woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we are dying? And he wakes up and he says two words. He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace and shut up! That's the, the, the true English translation of the Greek. And because God's word creates the reality it declares, and Jesus is God's word, when he says, peace be still, the sea does it. The wind ceases, and there is a dead calm. When we're anxious or afraid or out of control, the lack of what we think is an answer to our prayer should not keep us from praying. We should boldly turn to God in prayer and trust in his merciful provision because even though it's hard to tell the difference between no and wait, and even though sometimes the answer yes doesn't look like the way you wanted it answered yes, then nevertheless, the God is there and listening and he will give an answer. In fact, Jesus promises that if you pray in God's will, it will be given to you, which doesn't mean Lord Jesus, please let it be your will that I get a new Cadillac. Or, oh Lord, won't you buy me a color TV or a Mercedes Benz, right? Because that's not the way we pray. Oftentimes, I'm not saying that God doesn't change his mind through prayer because I think God's mind is changed. I think we see examples of that in scripture and I wrestle with that a little bit in my own faith. But what I will tell you is this, that a lot of times what prayer does is it doesn't change God, it changes you because it's an opportunity for you to reflect on and be reminded that God's will isn't necessarily yours and that God's will will be done because God alone has the power to give life and healing and forgiveness. And most of us can point to a time in our life or the life of somebody we care about where we prayed for something and something didn't get answered or didn't get handled or it, it seemed to totally be broken. And it's so difficult for us to distinguish these things. Yes, no, wait. But sometimes we can't see how our prayer was not in God's will or even more commonly how our answer didn't, the answer we got didn't seem like an answer at all. And then after waking up and yelling at the water, maybe he was a fisherman after all, he said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And, and the funny thing is, is that the answer is pretty much no. Because they had seen the miracles and they had seen the healings and they had seen all of these things done by the power of Jesus. We're five chapters into Mark now. This is the end of the chapter. And after you know, four chapters done, we look back on that and you've seen demons cast out, you've seen miraculous healings, you've seen teaching with authority, and after all of that, the disciples say, wow, this guy is amazing. That's all they got out of that experience. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's be honest. That's the question Mark wants you to ask. And that's the question that Mark's entire gospel is written in order to answer. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who then is this who can do these miracles? Who do you think you are to teach with that kind of authority? Who do you think you are standing up against the power of tyranny? Who are you? And soon Jesus will even ask his disciples the same question. Who is it that you say that I am? My question to you today, though, is this. If Jesus is who he says he is, why are you afraid? That thing that you're worried about, whatever it is, why are you anxious about it? If you're trusting God as best you can and clinging to the promises of hope 
the word of promise spoken in both testaments, the one that points you to the reality of God's redemptive work in the world, the one that points you beyond the suffering of this present day to the return of Jesus Christ, the one that points you not to pie in the sky, but to resurrection as our hope. If you trust the God who is leading you to these things, why are you afraid? And this is not to say that you don't have faith, but rather to say you're not trusting the faith that God has given. Because when we are anxious or afraid, we can trust God. And Jesus is inviting us to consider that if Jesus really is who the Gospels proclaim him to be, if he really is the Son of God, then we have a powerful ally on high. And when we're cornered and we are pushed back and the enemy is advancing against us, and when our defenses have been breached and by our own power, understanding, or strength, we have no chance of prevailing in the fight. We have a God who we can call upon and who will arrive in the nick of time and who will strike to protect us from our enemies in order to remind us of his love and providence and care. My prayer is that you can trust this God. And when you're st stuck and cornered, that you'll call in an airstrike in Jesus' name. Amen. We've come to the point in our service where we're going to take a look at our bulletins. So I'm going to ask you to get those out at this time. And I'll ask you to start on the front of the bulletin, where it says Up Armored Faith. Down at the bottom, it says Response Card. Let us know that you were here today. If you're joining us online today, I'm glad that you're joining us. Remember that you can use the Respond tab on our live streaming site, live.sog.church, to let us know that you are here to share this experience with us today. And when you get to service, you to choose 903. And then we'll flip it over. There's a couple of announcements and such that you should take a look at here on the back. But my question uh, for you to your, your mission assignment, time to assign yourself a mission. <laughs> the Army doesn't work like that. This week, I will watch for God to answer this prayer. This week, I will watch for God to answer this prayer. So uh, what I'm asking you to do is reflect on a prayer that you have already prayed. And then I want you to write that down as a rem rem reminder to be looking for that answer. And if you haven't been praying lately, that's okay. Now is the time to reflect on what is it that you really need God to come through for you. Below the fold, a couple more. First of all, if we can pray for you in any way, don't, uh, don't neglect the power of allies to help you. Share that prayer request with us. Check the box if you'd like that kept private. My question of the week this week is this. Have you witnessed God answer a prayer? And if so, what happened? How have you seen God answer a prayer? And uh, I'm just going to write down the name here, but I'll tell you the story. Some of you will know Sue Ashley. She was the lady with the crazy costumes who uh, worked at Fourth Avenue Coffee until recently, until she took a job back closer to home. Her husband fell off a roof three weeks ago and is still in the ICU at Good Samaritan in Kearney. They, uh, I don't know all the details, and I'm not up on all the medical terminology, but from what I understand, there was a surgery that needed to happen, but the anesthesiologist and the surgeon were afraid to operate because the clotting time was too slow. And the doctor said, we're not going to be able to operate until after the weekend. This was like Thursday. And she said, oh, no, we're going to pray about this. And, uh, you know, it had to get from 1.9 or something like that to 1.4, and I don't know what the units on that are. And uh, she sent out text messages and such to her church and others who cared and knew about the situation, and the next day when they drew the test again, it was 1.38.
that's cool. And that was just recently. So I think God does, still is in the business of answering prayer. Share your, your story with me on that question of the week. When you finish with your, uh, with your response card, tear it off the bottom of your bulletin and you can return that in the offering in just a few minutes. Please join me in prayer. Life-giving God, we give you thanks for those who watch over and protect us and especially as we look ahead to the 4th of July weekend, we pray for protection and safety for all who stand in the way of our enemies and also for those who will be celebrating. And Father, we actually uh, we, lift, we lift ourselves up to you hoping that we can trust in your mercy and your provision and we ask that you would help us to be people who are guided by faith so that when we're cornered and we feel like we have no other outlet, that we can call on you and trust that you will answer. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please rise and join us in the next song? confess the faith of the words of the Apostles' Creed. I, I believe, believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and, and he, he will, will come, come to, to judge the living and, and the dead. I believe in, in the Holy Spirit, Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the, the forgiveness, forgiveness of sins, sins the, resurrection the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Growing in faith and discipleship, we give thanks for God's merciful compassion as we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. In response to Lord in your mercy, you're invited to reply. Hear our prayer. Empowering God, you call your church to boldly proclaim your day of salvation, bringing unity to the faithful and provide opportunities for collaboration as we bring your good news to the world. Let the youth of our churches hear your love for them as they have gathered in Houston over the past week. Lord in your mercy, Creating God, you call forth life from the swirling waters of chaos, and you pour out water that nourishes the earth. Send forth ample rains for crops to flourish. 
Speak peace wherever homes, towns, businesses, and lands are damaged by hurricanes, tornadoes, flood, and tropical storms. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Powerful God, come to the aid of all nations and leaders who fear storms of conflict, violence, or injustice, especially with our President of the U.S. and our, all our elected leaders. Raise up advocates and peacemakers to speak truth and hope into the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Saving God, grant endurance and comfort to all who suffer affliction, hardship, hunger, violence, or sleepless nights of pain or anxiety. Give your promise of healing to all who long for salvation. We bring the petitions listed in our bulletin before you and these prayer petitions as well, either silently in our hearts or aloud so others may share them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Covenant God, you call us by name and claim us as your own. We pray for those who prepare for baptism and all who are called by baptism into lives of proclamation and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, instill peace in our leaders. We ask that you bring peace to our bishops, Elizabeth Eaton and Brian Moss, to Ted Carnahan and his family, and Pastor Orio and his family, and to our sisters and brothers at Key Ruaney Parish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comforting God in the midst of our own storms, give us courage and faith to face each challenge, confident in your presence and power over all of it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give thanks for all the saints who have committed themselves to you in every way and who have endured in faith. Bring us at last to the acceptable time of salvation for all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we lift to you these prayers and prayers of our hearts, trusting in your everlasting love and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Please share signs of God's peace with one another. You're invited to be seated for the offering. We're glad you're worshiping with Spirit of Grace this morning. We give because we support the ministry of Spirit of Grace as we follow God's mission to make disciples for Jesus Christ. For your convenience, you may also give at sog.church slash give or through the Spirit of Grace app. We'll send you a convenient link to these when you text the code SOGC to 77977. If this is your first time worshiping with us, please do not feel obligated to give. Instead, you can put your response card in the basket as it's passed to you. We're glad you're here today. This service is our gift to you. you to rise.
Merciful God, you open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. You have set this feast before us. Open our hands to receive it. Open our hearts to embrace it. Open our lives to live it. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this every time you take of it for the remembrance of me. And so gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and, and the, the glory, glory are yours, now, now and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to be seated. Holy Communion is a free gift from God for all who believe in his promises. As you believe in the life and death and resurrection of our Lord, our Lord welcomes you to his table. In receiving today, I'll break off a piece of bread for you, and then I'll put it in your open palm. And then you may dip, in, dip it into one of the cups. The first cup you'll come to is a clear chalice with light liquid, which is white grape juice. The second is a, dark is a ceramic chalice with dark liquid, which is red wine. Once you've dipped your bread into the cup, you may eat that and return to your seat by the center aisle. And as you do so, you'll pass a bowl of water on a low table. Uh, don't think of it as the Sea of Galilee or as a place of evil, but rather as a place where the, the peace and the calm of God prevails. And in, when united with God's word in the Holy Sacrament, marks each one of us with the cross of Christ forever. If you have... Uh, a need for a gluten-free communion, we have that for you as well. We take care to make sure it doesn't get cross-contaminated. Ask me when you come forward. I'll be happy to serve that to you. Now, following the directions of our First Impressions team ushers, come to the table. All is ready. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the on us. Lamb of 
you to rise as you are able for a blessing. The true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. We pray. Jesus Christ, our host and meal, you have given us not only this bread and wine, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace, for you are Lord forevermore. Amen. Amen.
May God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, grant you the gifts of faith and hope. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. 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 We sing. Peace, the Spirit sends us forth to serve. Thanks be to God.